Failure and Success The older Monsieur Bovary, Monsieur Charles Denis Bartholomé Bovary, had been a good-looking man when younger, with a big moustache and rings on his fingers. He was not, however, an impressive man, and although he wore expensive clothes, he always looked like an uncomfortable mixture of a military man and a cheap shopkeeper. His good looks and ability to sell himself did nevertheless win him a wife with a good income. After he was safely married, he lived for two or three years on her money. He ate and drank well, and spent his days lying in bed till midday, smoking his pipe, and never coming home till the theatres and cafes closed. When his father-in-law died, the old man left very little money to his daughter. Disappointed, Monsieur Bovary tried to start a textile business, but lost a lot of money, and finally retired into the country with the idea of showing the people there how to run a farm. However, he knew as little about agriculture as he did about textiles. He rode his horses instead of making them work ate the fattest chickens instead of selling them, and cleaned his shooting boots with his own best bacon fat. He soon discovered that he had little chance of making a fortune. Around this time, he found a place on the borders of Caux and Picardy, half farm, half private house, which he could rent for two hundred francs a year. He took it, and there, an angry, disappointed man, at war with the rest of the world, he shut himself up at the age of forty-five. He said that he was disgusted with other people, and wanted only to live by himself. At the beginning, his wife had loved him above all others, but this only seemed to add to his dislike of the world, and he never had a kind word for her. She had been cheerful, kind-hearted, and friendly, but as she grew older, in the same way that good wine turns into vinegar, she became bad-tempered and bad company. She was a hard worker, though, unlike her husband. She was always on her feet, always busy, hurrying to see the lawyers, knowing exactly when the next bills had to be paid. Indoors, she was always working, sewing, washing, keeping an eye on the men and paying them their wages. Her lord and master, paying no attention to what was going on around him, sat smoking by the fire. When the first Madame Bovary had a child, it became the centre of her world. The child's father, however, would have been happy to let him go without shoes. He said that it would be more natural not to give him clothes and to let him run around like a young animal. In contrast to his wife's ideas, he thought a boy would grow up to be a better man if he undressed in the cold, learned to drink alcohol, and laughed at the village priest. The child, a gentle little thing, made little progress in this kind of education. His mother always kept him close to her. She cut out pictures for him from the newspaper, and made up countless stories. In loving her son, she was looking for something to make up for the loneliness of her life. She dreamed he would be famous. She could see him as a tall, handsome, clever man, high up in the government service. She taught him to read and to sing while she played on her old piano. Monsieur Bovary said this was all a waste of time. How were they ever going to afford to educate him for a government job or help him start in business? Madame Bovary bit her lip and did not argue with her husband, and the child was allowed to run wild in the village. He went around with the farm workers, scared the birds by throwing stones at them, looked for wild fruit, helped in the fields wandered through the woods, and played with other children. On saints' days he helped ring the bells in the church, and he loved to hang on to the big rope and feel himself carried up as it rose in the air. And he grew as strong as a young oak tree, 
with big hands and red cheeks. When he reached the age of twelve, his mother managed to arrange for him to begin his studies with the priest, but the lessons were so short and badly organized that they did not do him much good. Sometimes it would be hot, and the child would grow tired, and before long the old man would be sleeping with his mouth wide open. At other times, the priest would see Charles playing with his friends and would call him over to test his Latin verbs. But then, perhaps, it would begin to rain, or someone they knew would come along, and lessons would be over for that day. The priest always had a good word for his pupil, though, and said that the young man had a very good memory. By the time young Charles was thirteen, even his father saw that something must be done and Charles left his unhappy home to spend three unhappy years in the college at Rouen. He wrote to his mother every week. He did his homework. He never did very well in his studies, but he never failed altogether. At the end of three years, his mother took him away from the college with the plan that he should study medicine. She got him a room on the fourth floor of a house overlooking a little river. She made arrangements for his meals, found some bits of furniture, a table and a couple of chairs, and an old bed, and made sure there was plenty of firewood to keep her poor boy warm. After a week of preparations, she went back home, asking him over and over again to look after himself and to study hard. The list of lectures which he read at the beginning of the term made his head spin. There were lectures on subjects he had never heard of, with names he could not even pronounce. He listened as hard as he could, but he could not understand what the lecturers were talking about. However, he attended every lecture and filled notebook after notebook. He got through his work like a horse that is used to turn a mill wheel, going round and round in the same place with his eyes covered, never knowing what he was doing or where he was going. Charles failed his medical examinations the first time. The course was too difficult for him. But his mother still believed in him and made his father pay for one more year. This time, Charles managed to pass, and his mother began to plan again. First, he must have somewhere to work, and then he must have a wife. The first problem was solved when the old doctor in Tostes, a small town near Rouen, died. Charles became the next doctor. Then his mother found a forty-five-year-old widow in Dieppe with an income of twelve hundred francs a year. Though she was ugly and bad-tempered, and twenty-five years older than Charles, her income made her attractive, and Charles thought the marriage would make his life better. He thought he would now have freedom and money to spend. He was wrong. His wife was in charge. She told him what to say and what not to say. She opened his letters, watched his movements, and when women patients were in the surgery, she listened from the next room. At night, when Charles came to bed, she put her long, bony arms round his neck and told him all her troubles. He did not love her. He loved someone else. Yes, she knew she would always be unhappy. And she always ended by asking him for some medicine and for a little more love. Chapter 2 Mademoiselle Emma One night, Charles received a letter asking him to come at once to a farm at Les Berteaux, where the farmer had broken his leg. The night was dark, and the farm was twenty-five kilometers away, but the farmer was a rich man, and Charles was still building up his business. So, at four o'clock in the morning, Dr. Bovary set out. A child was waiting at an open gate as he approached the farm. "'Are you the doctor?' he asked. As Charles rode along, he learned from the boy that Monsieur Rouault 
had broken his leg the night before. He also learned that he had lost his wife two years ago and had no one with him now except for his daughter, who looked after the house for him. Mademoiselle Emma, the farmer's daughter, came to the door and showed him into the kitchen. A fire was burning, and the men's dinner was cooking in big polished pans. Charles went upstairs to see the farmer. The broken leg was a simple problem, and Charles asked the servant and the young woman to help with the patient. As they tied up the farmer's leg, Charles was surprised to see how white her nails were. Her hands, however, were not beautiful, perhaps a little too red. She herself was too tall, and she did not have the kind of soft figure Charles liked. Her good point was her eyes. They were dark, almost black, and she looked at you honestly and fearlessly. As soon as he had finished looking after his patient, the doctor was invited by Monsieur Rouault to eat before he left. Charles went down into the room below, where two places had been laid with shining silver on a small table, and Mademoiselle Emma was waiting for him. A smell of flowers and clean clothes came from a cupboard opposite the window, and on the floor, in the corner, stood a few bags of wheat. Someone had hung a drawing of a Greek god in the middle of one of the walls. It was in an attractive frame, and written at the bottom were the words, To my dear father. They began by talking about Monsieur Rouault, and went on to discuss the weather and the cold winter. Mademoiselle Emma did not like the country very much, especially now she had almost all the responsibility of the farm on her shoulders. When Charles, who had been upstairs to say goodbye to the farmer, came back into the dining room, he found her standing by the window, looking out into the garden. She turned round. Are you looking for something? she asked. Yes, I'm trying to find my riding whip, he replied, and he began to look behind the doors and under the chairs. Mademoiselle Emma found it between the bags of wheat and the wall, and Charles went over to help. As he bent down, he felt the young woman's back rubbing against his chest. She stood up, blushing, and, looking at him over her shoulder, handed him his whip. Instead of going back to Les Berteaux three days later, as he said he would, he returned the next day and he then went to the farm twice a week. After forty-six days, Monsieur Rouault could move around without help, and people began to say what an excellent doctor Monsieur Bovary was. Père Rouault said the very best doctors in Yvetot or Rouen itself could not have treated him better. Charles did not ask himself why he liked going to Les Berteaux. If he had thought about it, he would have said to himself that it was a serious case, or he expected to earn a good fee. But was that really the reason why these visits to the farm were so pleasant? On days when he was visiting, he got up early and rode to the farm as quickly as he could, only stopping to clean his boots and to put on his black gloves before going into the house. He liked to ride into the yard, and see the farm boys as they came forward to meet him. He liked the house, and Monsieur Rouault, who held his hand and said he had saved his life. He liked the sound of Mademoiselle Emma's wooden shoes on the clean stone floor of the kitchen. When he left, she always came with him to the top of the steps, and would wait with him until the boys brought his horse. One day, at the end of the winter, it started to rain as he was leaving the house. She went back inside for an umbrella and put it up. It was a silk one, and it caught the sunlight, reflecting little coloured patches of light onto the whiteness of her skin. She smiled at him, and you could hear the sound of the raindrops as they fell, one by one, onto the tight surface of the silk. 
When Charles first began his visits to Les Berteaux, his wife always asked about his patient. But when she learned that the farmer's daughter had been to school and had learned dancing, geography, and drawing, and could play the piano, her interest changed to anger and dislike. At first she made unfriendly remarks about Mademoiselle Rouault, but Charles ignored them because he did not want an argument. So at last she told him to his face what she thought of him, and he did not know what to reply. Why did he keep going to Les Berteaux? Monsieur Rouault was well again now, and he had not paid his bill. Ah, she knew all about it. There was someone else there, someone who was a good talker, someone who was well-educated and clever. That was what he liked, young, pretty ladies. So Charles agreed to stop his visits to Les Berteaux, but now that he could not see Mademoiselle Emma, he decided he could love her. His wife was so unattractive, just skin and bone. She wore the same black clothes and grey stockings, the same ugly shoes all year round. So, if he could not see the farmer's daughter any more, he would dream of her. This unhappy situation lasted for several months, until one fine day in the early spring, the lawyer who had looked after Madame Bovary's affairs left town with all his client's money. She still had a share in a ship that was worth six thousand francs, and her house in Dieppe, but there was nothing left of that fortune she had been so proud of. And when her financial affairs were looked into more carefully, Charles's father found out that the house in Dieppe was mortgaged and her share in the vessel was not worth more than two hundred francs. She had lied, the good lady. Monsieur Bouvery Senior was so angry that he took up a chair and smashed it on the stone floor, and he told his wife she had ruined her son by making him marry an old woman like that. They came to Tost to tell Charles's rich wife what they thought of her. There was a terrible argument. Eloise begged her husband to defend her against his parents, and Charles did his best, but the old people were still angry when they left the house. The damage had been done. A week later, as she was hanging out the washing in the yard, Eloise Bovary found that she was spitting blood. The next day, while Charles had his back to her, opening the curtains, she cried out, Oh God! and fell to the floor. She was dead. How amazing! When the funeral was over, Charles returned to the house. He went up into the bedroom and saw her dress hanging up at the foot of the bed. He stayed there until it was dark, lost in sorrowful thought. After all, perhaps she had loved him. Chapter 3 A New Wife One morning, Père Rouault came to pay Charles for his treatment and to say how sorry he was to hear about his wife's death. Seeing how unhappy Charles looked, he said, You must make an effort, Monsieur Bovary. You will be happy again one day. Come and see us. My daughter asks about you and says that you are forgetting her. Spring will soon be here. Come and shoot a rabbit or two. Charles took his advice. He went back to Les Berteaux and found everything there just the same as before. The apple trees were already in flower, and Père Rouault did his best to make the doctor feel comfortable. He even told him a few stories, and Charles was surprised to find himself laughing. When he remembered his wife, he became serious again. But then the coffee came in, and he thought no more about her. Back home, he also thought of her less and less as he got used to living alone. He was free now to have his meals when he liked, he could go out and come in without having to give explanations, and when he was very tired, 
He could stretch out his arms and legs in bed as far as he liked. He gave himself little treats, let himself feel self-pity, and let people be nice to him. Moreover, his wife's death had been rather good for him professionally, because for a whole month people had been saying, Poor young man, what bad luck! So his name had been heard, and his practice had increased, and he could go to Les Berteaux whenever he wanted to. He was strangely happy, and looking at himself in the mirror as he brushed his moustache, he thought he had become better looking. He arrived at the farm one day at about three o'clock, when everyone was out in the fields. He went into the kitchen, but did not see Emma at first. The sunlight shone on the kitchen floor in long, narrow bars, reflecting on the ceiling. Flies on the table crawled up the glasses that had not been washed, or drowned in the cider in the bottom of a jug. Between the window and the fireplace, Emma sat sewing. She had no scarf around her neck, and he could see the fine hairs on her shoulders. Like all country people, she offered him a drink. He said no at first, but at last, with a laugh, she persuaded him to have a glass with her. She went to the cupboard and brought out the bottle, took down two small glasses, filled one, poured two or three drops into the other, and, tapping it against the doctor's, put it to her lips. As it was nearly empty, she leaned back to drink, and with her head back, she began to laugh because she could not taste anything. At the same time, she tried to catch some of the drops from the bottom of the glass with the tip of her tongue. Then she sat down and took up her work again, a white cotton sock which she was repairing. She worked with her head bent forward. She did not talk, nor did Charles. As he watched her, the only sound he could hear was the excitement of a hen that had laid an egg in the yard outside. After some time, Emma started to talk to him. She had been complaining ever since the spring about feeling dizzy. She wondered whether bathing in the sea would do her any good. She began to talk about her convent school and Charles about his college days. They went upstairs to her room, where she showed him her old music books and the prizes she had won. And she went on to speak of her mother, and even pointed out the bed in the garden where she gathered flowers on the first Friday in every month to lay on her mother's grave. She said she would like to live in town in the winter, although perhaps the long days made the country even more boring in the summer. And according to what she was saying, her voice was clear and strong, musical or almost a whisper, as if she was speaking to herself. That night, as he was riding home, Charles thought about the different things she had said, trying to remember them exactly to discover what they meant, so that he might understand how her life had been before he met her. Then he began to wonder how she would become if she married, and whom she would marry. Unfortunately, old Rouault was apparently very wealthy, and she herself so beautiful. But the thought kept coming to him. The doctor wants a wife. Yes, the doctor wants a wife. That night he could not sleep. He got up, took a drink from the water jug, and opened his window. The sky was filled with stars, a warm breeze was blowing, and, a long way off, some dogs were barking. He turned his head towards Les Berteaux. Thinking that, after all, he had nothing to lose by it, Charles made up his mind to ask her to marry him. But every time he was alone with her, the fear of being unable to find the right words left him unable to speak. In fact, Père Rouault would have been happy to see his daughter married, especially as she was very little use in the house. 
He made excuses for her, telling himself that she had too much intelligence for the farming life. When, therefore, he noticed that Charles blushed each time he was near his daughter, and that the young man was clearly interested in her, he gave the matter some thought. Although Charles was not the sort of man he would have chosen for a son-in-law, he was well-educated and a hard worker, and would not ask him for too much money to take his daughter off his hands. This mattered, as Monsieur Rouault had debts with most of his suppliers, and had just had to sell a large amount of land. If he asks me, he said to himself, he can have her. A little later, Charles came to spend three days at Les Berteaux. The time went quickly, and he never seemed to find the right moment to speak. As he was leaving, Monsieur Rouault came out to see him on his way. They had reached a bend in the road and were preparing to say goodbye. It was now or never. Charles gave himself until the corner of the field, and at last, when they had passed it, he said, almost in a whisper, Monsieur Rouault, there is something I want to say to you. They stopped. Charles could not speak. Come on, then, out with it. Do you think I don't know what it's all about? said the farmer, laughing quietly. Père Rouault, Père Rouault. Well, the farmer went on. There's nothing I would like better. But, though I am sure my little girl will agree, we must put the question to her. You go on, I'll go back to the farm. If it's yes, there'll be no need for you to come back. She'll need some time to get used to the idea. But, so you can be sure, I'll open the window in the front bedroom. You'll be able to see it from the back here. And with these words, he returned to the house. Charles tied his horse to a tree. He hurried back to take up his position and waited. Half an hour went by, then nineteen more minutes, which he timed by his watch. Suddenly, something banged against the wall. The window was open. She had accepted him. Next day, by nine o'clock, he was at the farm. Emma blushed when he came in, but tried to laugh a little, too. Père Rouault took his son-in-law in his arms. Then they began to talk about the arrangements. They had plenty of time before them, since the wedding could not take place until at least twelve months after the death of Charles's first wife, and that meant the spring of the following year. The wedding dinner was a grand affair. Forty-three people sat down at the table and remained there for sixteen hours, and the party which followed went on for several days. For most of the guests, it was a wedding to remember. The only person who did not enter the spirit of things seemed to be Madame Bovary Senior, who sat through the whole event with a sour look on her face. No one had asked her about the bride's dress or the arrangements for the party. She went to bed early. Her husband, however, did not follow her, but sent into Saint-Victor for cigars. He sat with the men and smoked until the morning, drinking and laughing until the sun rose. On the day of the wedding, Charles had not been a great success, he was neither a confident speaker nor a great teller of jokes. Next day, however, he seemed a different man. While Emma did not give the smallest idea of what she thought about it all, Charles was completely changed. He called her his wife, his dear, kept asking where she was, looked for her everywhere, and frequently took her out into the yard, where he was seen among the trees with his arm round her waist. Two days after the wedding, the newly married couple left. Charles could not be away from his practice any longer. Monsieur Rouault sent them home in his carriage, 
and went with them himself as far as Vassonville. There he kissed his daughter goodbye and started for home again on foot. When he had gone about a hundred meters, he stopped and looked back at the carriage disappearing down the road. Then he thought of his own wedding. Like Charles, he too had been happy when he took his wife from her father's house back to his own. She had ridden behind him through the snow. It was near Christmas, and the country all white. One of her arms held on to him, and over the other she carried her basket. When he turned his head, he saw close by him, just above his shoulder, her little smiling face. To warm her fingers, she had pushed them from time to time inside his jacket. How far away it seemed now! He looked back again, and there was nothing to be seen along the road. He felt as sad as an empty house. Monsieur and Madame Charles arrived at Tostes at about six o'clock. The neighbors came to their windows to take a look at the doctor's new wife. The old servant came to meet them and made excuses for the dinner not being ready, and suggested that, for the moment, Madame should come in and look around the house. Chapter 4 Two Worlds The front of the house looked straight onto the street. Hanging up behind the front door were the doctor's coat, a belt, a black leather cap, and on the floor in the corner a pair of boots covered with dried mud. To the right was the sitting-room, where meals were also eaten. White cotton curtains with a red border were hung along the windows, and above the fireplace there was a splendid clock and a head of Hippocrates. On the other side of the passage was Charles's consulting-room, a little box of a place about two metres wide, with a table, three ordinary chairs, and one armchair. A set of books the Dictionary of Medical Science, took up almost all the six shelves of the bookcase. They had been owned by many earlier doctors in Tost, but never read. The smell of cooking would come in through the thin wall during consultations, and anyone in the kitchen could hear the patients coughing and talking to the doctor as clearly as if they were in the room. The long, narrow garden ran down to the fields. Fruit trees grew along the stone walls, and four flower beds, planted with weak looking roses, were set around a square area which was used for vegetables. At the far end, under some low trees, there was a small white statue of a priest reading a prayer book. Emma went up to see the bedrooms. There was no furniture in the first one, but the second, their bedroom, contained their new bed with its red curtains. There was a box made of seashells on a chest of drawers, and on the desk, by the window, stood a glass bottle with a bunch of dried flowers tied with white ribbon. They were the flowers from his first wife's wedding. Charles saw her looking at them and took them out of the room. Sitting in an armchair while her maid unpacked her things, Emma thought about her own wedding flowers, lying in one of the boxes, and she wondered what would happen to them if she died young. Charles was a happy man now. In bed in the morning, with her head on the pillow beside him, he would look at the sunlight on her cheek and at her beautiful eyes when she woke. He could lose himself in those eyes, looking into them until he saw a tiny picture of himself his nightcap on his head, and the collar of his shirt open. As soon as he was up and dressed, she would go to the window to see him start his day. Down in the street below, Charles would prepare to get onto his horse while she went on talking to him from above. Sometimes she might find a feather and send it floating through the air to be caught in the long hair on his old white horse's neck. As he rode off, Charles would blow her a kiss, and she would wave back to him. 
It was the first time in his life that he had tasted such happiness. He had been lonely and friendless at school and when he was studying medicine, and then he had had fourteen months of married life with the widow whose feet in bed were like lumps of ice. But now this lovely woman was his for life. Before she married, Emma too had thought she was in love, but the happiness that should have come from love was somehow missing. It seemed to her that she must have made a mistake, must have misunderstood things in one way or another. And as she stood by her bedroom window, morning after morning, Emma tried hard to understand what exactly the words joy, love, desire meant. They had always seemed so beautiful to her in books, but what did they mean in real life? Novels had always seemed more real to her than the life she had to live. When she was at her convent school, a teacher sometimes secretly lent such books to the older girls. They were all about love, lovers, beautiful girls, ladies in danger, horses ridden till they dropped dead, dark forests, tears and kisses, and gentlemen as brave as lions. When she was fifteen, Emma read the works of Walter Scott for the first time, and found she was happier in this imagined past than her rather boring present. The characters she read about in these books were much more interesting than the teachers and students she saw around her. She had felt a thrill each time she blew back the thin paper which protected the pictures. She saw young men holding young women in white dresses in their arms, or English ladies with golden hair who looked at you with big, bright eyes. In her reading, she was able to listen to the sound of heavenly music and of falling leaves. Later, after her mother died, she even fell in love with the church and thought of staying in the convent, of never going out into the world. But in her last year of school, she began to lose her interest in religion. When her father took her away, her teachers were not sorry to see her go. She had, they thought, stopped showing any respect for their community. On her return home, Emma tried to find an interest in managing her father's house, but she soon grew tired of the country and wished herself back in her convent. When Charles came to Les Berteaux for the first time, she thought of herself as a disappointed woman, one for whom life had nothing new to offer, either in knowledge or experience. Maybe her wish for a change, possibly too the unrest caused by the presence of an unknown man, had been enough to make her believe that she was at last in love. But now she could not believe that her present state was the happiness she had dreamed about. Nevertheless, she sometimes thought that these were, in fact, the happiest days of her life. Of course, it would have been so much better if they could have gone far away to lands whose names fall like music on the ear, where the weddings of lovers are followed by mornings of soft delight, and where, when the sun goes down, you breathe, sitting beside the sea, the sweet perfume of the lemon trees. Why did her bedroom window not look out onto the Swiss or Scottish mountains? Why did her husband not stand beside her in a black silk jacket, the wind blowing his long hair back from his pale white forehead? But Charles could not read these thoughts, and was not able to share her dreams, and as their lives became closer, Emma, in fact, began to have a secret feeling of distance from her husband. Charles's conversation was uninteresting to her. He told her that when he lived in Rouen, he never had the smallest desire to go to the theatre. He could not swim. He had no idea of how to use a sword. He could not fire a gun. He knew nothing, and he wanted nothing. He thought she was happy, and his heavy, comfortable happiness had begun to annoy her. A few weeks after they came to Tost, 
one of Charles's patients presented Madame with a little Italian hunting dog. She took it with her for walks, because she used to go out sometimes just to get a few moments to herself and to enjoy a change from the garden and the dusty road. She would go as far as the woods near Banville, along by the empty summer-house at the end of the wall, towards the open country. There, at the side of the lake, the plants grew higher than a man and had leaves as sharp as knives. Sitting at the edge of the wood among the pink and blue wild flowers, her thoughts would wander here and there, like her dog, which ran from one place to the next, chasing the birds and insects. But in the same way that her dog always came back to her, she always came back to the same question. My God, why did I marry him? She would then call Jali, the name she had given her dog, to come to her, and, stroking her long, graceful head, would say, Come, kiss your mistress. You have no worries, have you? Then she would look into the creature's beautiful, sad eyes, and a feeling of tenderness would come over her. Pretending the animal was herself, she would talk to her aloud as if she were comforting someone. Towards the end of September, however, an extraordinary event happened in her life. She was invited to La Vaubiessard, the home of the Marquis d'Andervilliers. The Marquis, who had been a minister in the national government, wanted to get back into politics, and he was now doing his best to make himself popular. During the winter months he had given firewood to the poor, and he was always the first to demand new roads for his district. During the summer he had had a painful mouth infection, which Charles had managed to cure before it became really serious. The servant who was sent to Tost to pay for the treatment told his master when he got back that he had seen some splendid cherries in the doctor's little garden. Cherries did not grow well at La Vaubiessard, and the Marquis asked Bovary to let him have a few baskets. He then decided to come in person to thank the doctor, saw Emma, and noted that she had a pretty figure and good manners. After this, the Marquis decided that he would not harm his chances in the coming vote if he sent the young people an invitation to his house. And so, one Wednesday at three o'clock, Monsieur and Madame Bovary set off in their carriage to La Vaubiessard, with a big travelling bag tied on behind and a hat-box fixed in front. They arrived when it was getting dark, just as the lamps were being lit in the park to guide the carriages. The Chateau La Vaubiessard, a large building in sixteenth-century style, stood in the centre of parkland. A stream flowed between tall trees and beneath a bridge, and through the evening mist they could see cottages and farm buildings. Charles stopped the carriage at the foot of the steps leading up to the front door, and two servants came down to take their bags. Then the Marquis came forward, and offering his arm to the doctor's lady, walked with her into the hall. Under the high ceiling, their voices and footsteps sounded as if they were in a church. As she passed through on her way to the main room, Emma saw large, dark paintings of the Marquis's relatives, some in the clothes of the royal court, others in the uniforms of army or navy officers. When the Marquis opened the door for them, one of the ladies rose. It was the Marquis herself, and came forward to welcome Emma. She made her sit down beside her on a low chair, and began to chat with her, as if she had known her for a long time. At seven o'clock, dinner was served. The men were seated at the first table in the hall, the ladies at the second in the dining room, with the Marquis and the Marquise. At the long dining tables, the glasses were filled with iced champagne. Emma felt a thrill go through her as she tasted the coldness of it in her mouth. She had never seen some of the fruit that they had on the table, and even the sugar seemed whiter here and more finely powdered than elsewhere. After dinner there was dancing. 
More guests were arriving, and the room filled with people. Emma sat down near the door and watched the men talking and smoking cigars in small groups in their black and white evening dress, as the servants moved among them, carrying drinks and more small, delicate things to eat. All along the rows of seated women she could see smiles, half hidden, half revealed, by the flowers the ladies held. Everywhere there was silk, the flash of jewels and gold, white arms, and hair piled high on elegant heads. Emma's heart beat faster when, her partner holding her by the tips of her fingers, she took her place in line and stood waiting for the dance to begin. But her nervousness soon disappeared, and moving to the music, she flew on as light as a bird. The memories of her past life, which until then had always been so clear, disappeared so completely in the magic of the moment that she could hardly persuade herself they were not a dream. There she was, no doubt about that. During a break in the dancing, supper was served, and again the wine flowed freely, accompanied by seafood soup, sweet puddings, and all kinds of cold meats. Now people with longer journeys began to get into their carriages and drive off one after another. Charles was half asleep with his back against a door, but not everyone was ready to leave, and it was at three in the morning when the last dance began. Only the guests who were staying the night at the chateau were still there. One of these, a viscount whose evening dress fitted him like a glove, came a second time to invite Madame Bovary to dance. They began slowly, and then increased their speed. They turned, and everything around them turned, the lamps, the furniture, and the floor. As they swung past the doors, Emma's dress blew up in the air. The Viscount looked down at her. She raised her eyes to his. For a moment she lost her breath and stopped. Then off they went again, quicker than ever, racing down to the high windows at the far end of the room, where she nearly fell, and for a moment rested her head on his chest. And then, still turning, but more gently now, he took her to her seat. She leaned back against the wall and covered her eyes with her hands. Then there was a little more conversation, and after saying good night or good morning, the guests went off to bed. Charles dragged himself upstairs on heavy legs, but Emma did not want to sleep. She opened the window and sat with her head in her hand. The night was dark. A few drops of rain were falling. She breathed in the damp wind that blew cool against her eyelids. The dance music was still playing in her ears, and she tried to keep awake in order to keep the dream alive for as long as she could. As she stood there, the sun began to rise beyond the trees, and she shivered with cold. She undressed and got down between the sheets, close up to Charles, who was asleep. There were twelve or fifteen of them at breakfast, which, to Charles' surprise, was all over in ten minutes. After that, a small group went with Mademoiselle d'Andevilliers for a walk through the park, and then, to amuse the lady, the Marquis took Emma to see his stables, while Charles went to ask one of the men to bring his horse and carriage. When Emma returned, the Bovarys said their goodbyes to the Marquis and Marquise, and turned their horse's head towards Tost and home. Emma sat in silence. Their bags banged against the back of the carriage as they made their way down the rough road. They had reached the high ground at Thibourville when suddenly a group of gentlemen, laughing and smoking cigars, rode past them. Emma thought she recognized the Viscount who had danced with her last night. She turned round to have another look, but they were already too far away. A little later they had stopped to make a small repair to the carriage. When he had finished, Charles noticed something lying on the ground between his horse's legs. He bent down and picked up a beautifully made green silk cigar case, with two cigars still inside it. "'They'll be good this evening after dinner,' 
he put the case in his pocket and started the horse. When they got home, the evening meal was not ready. Madame became angry, and the maid, Nastasi, replied rudely. You can leave, said Emma. You are finished here. So all they had for dinner was onion soup with a small piece of meat and some vegetables. How nice it is to be back home again, said Charles, cheerfully rubbing his hands as he sat down opposite Emma. They could hear Nastasi weeping as they ate. Charles was rather fond of the poor girl, who had kept him company after his first wife died, when he had nothing to do. She had been his first patient, the first person he ever got to know in Tost. Have you really told her to leave? he said at last. Yes. Why not? she replied. After supper, they went into the kitchen to warm themselves while the bedroom was being prepared. Charles began to smoke. He pushed out his lips, spat repeatedly, and pulled his head back every time he breathed in the smoke from the cigar. You'll make yourself ill, she said. He put the cigar down and went to get himself a drink of water. Quick as lightning, Emma picked up the cigar case and threw it into the back of the cupboard. Time went so slowly the next day. Emma walked around her little garden, up and down, up and down, stopping to look at the flower beds, at the fruit trees, looking at all these familiar things, things that she knew so well, but which now seemed so strange. How far away the chateau seemed already. Her journey to La Vaubiessard had changed her life, but left it feeling empty. However, she accepted her fate. She folded up her beautiful dress and laid it carefully away in the chest of drawers with her dancing shoes. She had now known wealth and luxury, and life would never be the same. The memory of this visit to the chateau became part of her life. Each Wednesday she would sigh as she awoke and say to herself, A week ago today, a fortnight ago today, Three weeks ago, I was there. But little by little, the faces of the people became faint in her memory, and she forgot the tunes she had danced to. The servants' clothes, the look of the rooms came back less clearly to her vision. Some of the details faded away, but the empty space in her heart